did. Yes. He just found it out okay. when he was getting the transcript ready. Ah, two weeks. Yeah, no, I got to call that. I'd ask uh, Bob Perry to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the November 30th, 2017 meeting of the Shawnee County Board of Commissioners. My name is Bob Archer. I currently have the honor of serving as chair of the commission and represent District 3 alongside Commissioner Shelley Bueller, who represents District 1, and Commissioner Kevin Cook, who represents District 2. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, first item of business, and let me, uh, before we get started, <coughs> Uh, asked that we pull items C2 and C4 from the agenda at the request of the sheriff's office. Uh, these need more work, uh, more analysis. And so if there's not a concern with that. No objection. No okay. objection. Very good. Um, so item C2 and, and C4, uh, Madam Clerk. First item of business, please. Item one, proclamations, presentations, uh, presentation of space study, Brian Falk, Falk Architects. Good morning, Commissioners. Bill Kroll, Facilities Maintenance Director. Um, earlier this year, you authorized us to go forward and look at a space planning study. Uh, we contracted with Falk Architects for that study. Brian has completed his work at this time and is ready to make a presentation. Uh, by no means is this a finished product. It's going to need input from, of course, you folks to let us know uh, what direction you might want to go. Brian does have some options and things for us to consider, but has looked over a lot of things, including who he thinks needs to actually be here at the courthouse or elsewhere to serve the public. So a lot of thought went into this, and Brian did visit with, with a lot of folks on it. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian. And Hello. Good morning. Let's just pull the PowerPoint up. Well, thanks for uh, taking the time to listen to this today. We started this probably about eight months ago. Uh, primary goals are to ease some of the crowding in the courthouse. It's a little bit crowded in here. We're looking for potential uh, departments that could shift to uh, a couple different buildings that have some excess space. So we've got the North Annex that has some excess, excess space, the fire station on the Expo Center grounds, and the elections office. And then we're also looking for efficiencies that occur could occur by shifting up departments around. Um, some departments need to be next to each other, others don't. Uh, lastly, we, we uh, are looking for a FEMA shelter at the Annex is one of the, the goals of the study. So the four buildings included in the study, uh, we didn't include every <coughs> building in, that the county owns. It was the courthouse, the North Annex, <coughs> fire station, the elections office. And if you're unfamiliar with what those buildings are, I'll just show this to everybody. It's the fire station, and that's the elections office. Can I clarify one thing? Brian? Yes. The fire station meaning not the city fire station that's not the city right? fire station it's okay. the historic uh, 1930s fire station okay. that was formerly occupied by trainer architects okay, that's, thank you that's just right. wanted to make sure <laughs> we're yeah. not getting you, reversed from that's right okay. <laughs> yeah there's two fire stations it's the the, the smaller <laughs> older one <coughs> these are the departments included in the study uh, i won't read each one off uh, but not every department was included these departments were not included okay. in the study and basically, these are uh, the ones that were included are within those four buildings that we talked about. So our process was we interviewed the department heads and created a data collection worksheet, uh, creating adjacencies and uh, a matrix showing the number of employees per department, spatial needs for each department, 
And uh, then we documented the approximate locations of each department and created uh, CAD or Revit files that gave us square footages for each department in, within each building. And then we analyzed the matrix. Uh, we made some preliminary recommendations to uh, you a few months ago. And uh, we're, that first, first round was fairly broad, and we were looking for feedback at that, that point. And we're still at a pretty high level, and we're still looking for feedback, but I think we've narrowed it down considerably. <laughs> we followed up with in-person interviews with department heads. Prior to that, we didn't talk directly with each department head. We, we worked uh, in more through the worksheets. We, we actually asked each department head, would, would it be possible? How much would it upset you? Um, had a detailed list of questions on the second round. Then we uh, identified more relocation scenarios. And, uh, and then we, uh, just a few weeks ago, we reviewed uh, kind of another set of scenarios with a group of department heads and got some really good feedback. And I think we've landed on some pretty good recommendations at this point. So I know you can't read this, but this is the matrix that was created, and it should be in, in the packet that I sent at a legible. But you can see there's a, quite a bit of detail in here, that everything from the amount of employees per department, square footage, uh, whether they might be able to be relocated, <coughs> lots of information within that matrix. So sticking, so I'm not sure. Anybody have any? Let's try this. There we are. Okay, so spatial needs <laughs> per department. Uh, you can see each department had kind of a list of things. Some departments had a really long list, and it you know it kind of depends on the person. Maybe maybe certain people have a you know a little bit more intense need for change than others, and others are okay with the way they are. Uh, but we documented each department and kind of things that they they might like to see changed. I won't go over that, and I'm trying to keep this to about 15 minutes or so. So. Yeah and give you guys questions. And the third district court had the longest list of items that they kind of need or would like changed. <coughs> so the fire station has about 2,850 square feet available, 17 parking spots. It has a challenge of, it's an upper level, it's not very accessible, it's a windy staircase, it's fairly thin to get up there. So roughly half the square footage is, isn't prime office space. Um, it, it actually used to office out of it. It's a nice, if you can get up there and you're mobile, it's a nice space to office out of, but it's got that limitation of the staircase. Uh, it has lots of historic charm. It's got really nice finishes. I think it's a, a nice space to office out of. And it's also kind of located fairly close to downtown in the center of the city. The elections office basement, uh, it's <coughs> colored green here, and there's a red <coughs> arrow pointing at it. It's currently unfinished. I think it actually has some nice charm to it as well. It's kind of a rough, <coughs> rough quality right now. It's unfinished, but it's got concrete beams, lots of windows. Uh, there's 2,745 square feet available. There's 60 parking spots. Um, it is a walkout air area or has the potential to have doors to, to walk out. Uh, there is shared bathrooms and break areas and conference rooms that are available adjacent to this. Uh, elections office is currently using quite a bit of it for storage space, which potentially could be consolidated within that space to a smaller area, or it could be moved to a different space that's not as uh, prime for potential office use. The North Annex, I colored the spaces that could be available in yellow and highlighted them with a red arrow here. Uh, it's, North Annex has a lot of extra space currently. The, the offices that are currently there, the departments, uh, the, the usages of those offices could be squeezed down so that they make better use of the space that they're in. Uh, it does have a little bit of a challenge with parking right now. So there's lots of square footage, lots of area for parking, but it tends to be on the wrong side of the building. And so we may have to make some adjustments to parking depending on where we land, on which departments are going in there. We may need to add a little bit of pavement to make it, make it work better. Um, switch over. And then finally, the courthouse on the main level, there is right, right as you enter on the uh, right side, there's 850 square feet available. Uh, maybe the courts or DA or the commission could take this space. It's a, a pretty good space and it really is, it ought to go to something that needs a lot of public access. That would be the best use for the space in our opinion. 
This is a diagram we, we created. Uh, basically, it's showing kind of relationships between different departments in the courthouse and which departments really need to be located within the courthouse, which we found to be the, obviously the court and the district attorney. And the other <coughs> departments had uh, different degrees of uh, relationships to the courthouse. We found the county commission probably because of ceremonial processes that happen here probably want to be located within the within the courthouse but it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, emergency management probably needs to be because of all the infrastructure that's in there it's and there's really it's in the basement it's in a safe location it, it just makes sense at this point um, and then all the other departments either uh, there's really not a strong relationship or the relationship <coughs> has to do with proximity to other departments for instance treasurer clerk counselor, appraiser, and register of deeds tend to uh, want to be next to each other. And we don't have a, a, a county office building per se that has the available space that they could all move at the same time. And then the other departments in, in blue on bottom right are at the North Annex. The bottom left ones are potentially departments <laughs> that either also are not located in the courthouse or could be moved. So information technologies was one that came up that um, of the departments we, we interviewed everybody, nobody's really excited to move. Everybody kind of likes what they're doing right now. And so it's really trying to find the department that it affected the least or was willing to, to move. Information technologies, uh, initially they thought maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to move, but after um, more discussion, they, they agreed it probably made sense. Uh, maintenance decided that they could consolidate some of their space here at the courthouse so they could move their offices out of where they're currently officing and go to actually the maintenance room, the work room. Uh, human resources we thought could potentially move. They don't have a strong connection really with any individual department and uh, potentially some of the other spaces <coughs> would be an easy switch for them. And then finally the counselor's office uh, could be moved and they, they describe their relationship as Kind of like any private uh, attorney in town, so they don't necessarily need to be located here or any any one location. They can work remotely. So um, I kind of summarized this earlier. Maintenance was willing to adjust, uh, and so it, what that would do is it free up uh, about a 400 square foot office type space in the basement of the courthouse for another use. Information technologies. Uh, about 5,000 square feet of their square footage here could be, and it's all office, could be relocated to another location. They need to keep their servers and all their equipment that's costly to move here. So that would need to stay and we need to work around those, those pieces of equipment. Surveyor should stay. Uh, human resources, they kind of didn't, weren't excited to move, uh, but if they did move, they, they told me that they'd prefer the fire station over the North Annex. And they would fit into the fire station easily. They, the square footage they currently have is much less than what the uh, square footage of the fire station is. Uh, another thing that might be nice about that is oftentimes when people go to human resources, it might be a private issue. So having it remote and a little bit away from other departments might be an opportunity uh, for the county to offer a little more privacy for those, those transactions and discussions. Uh, counselor's office, one, one thing about uh, them, they, they <coughs> They tend to like private offices, so if we could find a space with five private offices, an admin space, and a meeting room. The, the fire station doesn't, has kind of open offices right now, so it may not be the best uh, space for them unless we may make modifications to it. And here, clerk, uh, again, the, some of the departments need adjacencies, so clerk, uh, register of deeds, uh, both needed adjacencies with some other departments, and so I'm not recommending that they move out of the uh, cor courthouse right now. Motor vehicle, um, they, they don't think that the North Annex fire station or elections office would work well for their purposes. So those are the buildings in our, in our study. However, they do think it would be beneficial. You probably know this already. I think he's talked with you about it to move away from the courthouse. And so if we could find a good building for, for them that would work for their purposes, the, the space that they have here in the courthouse would free up. And it's actually a pretty prime space in the courthouse on the main level. The treasurer uh, needs to be with clerk registered deeds and audit finance. So uh, we're not recommending they move from the courthouse. And uh, so the free space that's available, Annex has about 7,900 square feet available. 
elections, um, 2745, uh, I think, and yeah, okay, and uh, fire station about 2800 square feet. All, so if we put, we could put the human resources, like I mentioned, or county councilor in the fire station. County councilor might require some modifications. Human resources probably require less modifications. However, from a sta square footage standpoint, county councilor fits the fire station a little bit better. North Annex, we're looking at uh, information technologies to moving into that space. They need about 5,000 square feet. North Annex has about 7,900 square feet. We probably shuffle some departments around to really optimize that space yet. But until we decide on which departments are moving where, we haven't gotten into the details of how that could be shuffled around. Also, uh, human resources could move in there. S uh, facilities maintenance, if they wanted some additional space, there's some additional space there. And county councilor could fit. So we've got a lot of space there, a lot of opportunities, depending on what direction we decide to go there. Here's a kind of an aerial view of the North Annex. And so currently there's 100, approximately 120 paved spaces, but we could easily um, upgrade and increase the amount. However, you can see uh, West is to the left. Um, it would require kind of digging into some of these other uh, storage type spaces for uh, for trash um, uh, and bins, different bins and the storage needs and vehicle storage. <coughs> so elections office, uh, one of the things about this space is nobody really uh, seems interested in moving there. So what we are recommending is that it serves as a backup um, kind of a meeting space for county commission if you ever needed a backup space for if there was an emergency or something. Or it could also serve as um, a backup if there was an emergency um, operations that needed a, a second location. This would, we think, would be a pretty good backup location for both those departments. Courthouse, uh, there's 850 square feet available. If, if uh, IT moved out, it opened up another 5,000. And uh, if the county councilor moved out another 2,600, and facilities maintenance 400, and uh, HR 775. So, and finally, if motor vehicles, it'd be 3,100. That'd be 12,725 square feet that could be opened up in the courthouse if, if we felt like all that space could be used for a different purpose. And some of the purposes we talked about is maybe there could be um, additional meeting rooms, office spaces for courts and DA. Maybe the uh, county commission might want to move from the basement because it's, it's a less of a ceremonial field, move it up to the main level so that it have <coughs> greater access to the public and uh, maybe a little bit more appropriate for what's happening in this room. Um, the courthouse, uh, space needs of the courthouse. District attorney is currently paying for um, storage offsite and office space offsite, which uh, is approximately 21, or exactly $21,845 per year. And so if we can give them some space within the courthouse, the county can save $21,845 just by shifting some different departments around. Uh, they need some shared conference rooms, jury waiting rooms, uh, possibly again relocating the chamber to the first floor and uh, additional courtrooms <coughs> and so that's kind of the goal of things is to open up some space here in the courthouse and it's just a matter at this point of deciding how do we do that and then we can get into the specifics of which departments move exactly to which room in each each building so if you have any questions i'd be open to them commissioners questions for mr Falk? all interesting propositions, but obviously we're not to an end result yet. Yes. Uh, I think there's more work to be done and maybe trying to work with the department heads as to what would serve the public needs the best. Commissioner Bueller. Just a couple of questions on, um, you had the district attorney's needs, but then the court, how, how much does the court needs in terms of square footage? Do they need additional square footage? Yeah, let's go over to uh, that. There it is. I don't know that I see a square footage. Is yeah. There, is there? Um, there is. Uh, it's it's a lot. It, and it kind of <laughs> depends on, it is, it, there's a long list on the court. Right. Yeah, and it depends on, there's everything from having dedicated uh, e uh, uh, circulation for judges, public, and inmate. 
that's one of those things that they've requested. That's a that's a huge endeavor that probably can't happen with this building. Uh, almost certainly can't happen with this building without a lot of changes. And so a lot of the things they're asking for are, are really kind of a big items that uh, probably won't happen with this building. Um, th there's additional courtrooms. There's uh, meeting rooms. There's just a very very long list that they probably could happen but it's a it's a big it's a big programming effort just to even understand everything that they want it, if we look at that we probably need to be looking at how, how do we really modify this for a exclusive courthouse that's exclusive to the DA and the courts and then move all the other functions to a dedicated office building if we wanted to achieve their goals a hundred percent on the uh, appraiser's office, or not the appraiser's office, register of deeds, was there any discussion about shrinking that square footage as well? Was that included in those in those amounts? Yeah, um, I, they definitely can shrink a little bit. I, I haven't defined exactly how much, and okay. so um, that's something I'll I'll look at though and get you an answer on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. More work to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is going to be a challenge. We are running out of space. And this is very preliminary, but it gives us a starting point uh, for discussion uh, for 2018. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, sir. Next Thank item. You. Thank you. Next sure. item, please. Item three, consent agenda. Questions or comments on the consent agenda? There are three items. I have no questions. I'll move approval. Second. Motion made to approve the consent agenda by Commissioner Bueller, seconded by Commissioner Cook. <coughs> All in favor say aye. Oppose no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. And item four, new business. A county clerk number one, consider all voucher payments. <coughs> Commissioners, this morning there are vouchers that total $3,218,056.19. This is a combined voucher report due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, kind of getting us all back on track with everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the Highlights out of the voucher report were the employee withholdings, $410,153.20. General expense funds, which included a KPNF contribution for the Sheriff's Office of $248,393.23. Holding accounts with the State of Kansas Motor Vehicle, which was $200,361.91. Health insurance premiums. $290,853.16. Parks and Recreation, $117,420.39. The Sheriff's Office had $550,263.87. The highlights out of that, Sheriff's, were again KPNF contributions as well as Tyler Technology, which is the New World, um, which included expenditures including Topeka Fire Department, Topeka Police Department, and Department of Corrections. JADO, which was $642,547.82, and then finally Solid Waste with $288,918.08. I don't have any questions regarding the vouchers and would move for their approval. A second. Motion made to approve the voucher report by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Mueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to nothing. Next item, please. A2, consider correction orders. Move for Second. Motion made to approve the correction orders by Commissioner Bueller, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Oppose no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item A3, consider approval of resolution number 2017-76, authorizing a serial malt beverage license, including Sunday sales to Lake Shawnee Golf Management, DBA uh, Forbes Golf Course, located at 700 K Park Road. I'll um, move to it. Oh, I'm Let's sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Say, well, it's my little, my normal spiel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Approved by the or reviewed by the county councilor. Uh, KBI has uh, given their stamp of approval. Township was notified, and the health inspection and the taxes are there were no taxes, so there were no taxes to pay. Everything was okay. Very good. Thank you. I'll I'll move to adopt the resolution. Thank you. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed. No motion carries. Three to zero. Next item, please. Item B, Bond Council number one, consider approval of resolution 2017-77, authorizing the creation of a Shawnee County Public Building Commission. 
Good morning, Bob Perry. Let me move these before I knock them off. Uh, this resolution uh, would create a Shawnee County Public Building Commission. Um, the purpose of the commission is to finance the acquisition of capital improvements and lease those to the county for county use. Uh, this resolution proposes that the Board of County Commissioners of Shawnee County also serve as the three members and governing body of the PBC. And the reason why we're proposing that a PBC be created is, is the obligation pledged by the county to any PBC revenue bond holders is more or less a backdoor general obligation. The obligation of the county to pay the PBC rental payments basically is accepted from the cash basis law and <coughs> accepted from the budget and counting laws. And in doing so, the legislature has said that if you enter into a lease with a PBC for certain capital improvements, you must make the rental payment. Should you not make the rental payment, it's my opinion that the bondholders uh, could compel a payment through the act of mandamus. And the reason why we're suggesting that this be created and done is because PBC bonds carry substantially less interest cost than a sales tax revenue bond. And this is being proposed in anticipation of the improvements that you're looking at making to the Expo Center. Uh, the process is pretty simple, really. You would create the PBC once there's a consensus amongst you, yourselves and the staff in the county of the type and scope of improvements that you'd want at the Expo <coughs> Center. You would ask the PBC to issue its revenue bonds in an estimated amount of X. The PBC would then pass a resolution of intent expressing its intent to issue the bonds. That resolution of intent would be published once a week, two consecutive weeks, and a 30-day protest period would run. And you have the same <coughs> procedure if you do sales tax revenue bonds. So there's no difference there. The, the, and I looked this up last week. My <coughs> memory is, is the election in 2016 that authorized the extension of the sales tax was carried by over 60% of the electorate or close to it. Um, so in essence, the whole purpose of this is to have a vehicle through which you could borrow money at a lower interest cost. Uh, the PBC statutes were created in the mid-60s in order to give counties, in particular, <coughs> the ability to finance the acquisition of new jails and courthouses. The lease payment term can be as long as 50 years. I don't anticipate that. I anticipate what the expo is going to be the same as with the uh, sales tax deadline when it ends in 2031. It's just another option. Mm -hmm. We think you ought to have it. Commissioner Cook. <clears throat> what is the risk and liability of having a public building commission? Well, the only issues I've seen arise in the past, Kevin, is when you, you add, add additional non-elected officials to the PDC governing body. Uh, I've had a couple of situations several years ago where you could have no less than three, no more than seven. And uh, the county commission and a couple of rural counties decided they'd add <coughs> some extra individuals. Um, Politics being what it is, people became dissatisfied with some policies. Next thing they knew, they had four members who outnumbered the three commissioners. Uh, that's really the only problem I've seen. Okay. But we're not exposing the county to any risk or liability to our bond ratings or... No, I, 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 not that I can tell today. Um, the fact that the county received an uptick in its rating <coughs> last month, buddy, I think helps in the aspect that the pledge on, on a PBC is a pledge of the county to make the rental payments. And it's an unrestricted pledge, as opposed to like when we do the COP financings, which are lease purchase financings, those are subject to an annual appropriation. And there's a risk there. You might, you don't have to appropriate. Now, I don't know of any municipality in the state that has it, but you don't have to. And the investors build that risk into the interest costs. They get a, bit, a little bit more interest. In the past, when we've done the cops, there's been no real difference because people were still thinking of the recession and a return of their money as opposed to on their money. Um, but it, with a simple, couple of the samples that we've located and attached to the uh, resolution, it's clear that there's a substantial difference in the, the 
interest costs between a sales tax revenue bond and a PBC bond. You're still going to use the sales tax revenues to pay the PBC bonds, but that's not what's pledged. What's going to be pledged is, is the obligation to make sure the rental payments are made. Okay. That's the questions I had. Commissioner Dula. Well, and this just establishes the Public Building Commission. We're not setting any, like you said, any amount or time and the scope of it. This is just establishing the it, public. It creates the PVC. It appoints right. you three as the as members, the, the governing body. Right. And your terms as uh, PVC members will be coterminous with your terms as the Board of County Commissioners. And as PVC members, you'll occupy the same position, chairman, vice chairman, member, as you do here. This way, in my mind anyways, we have elected officials controlling the PBC acts because the PBC basically is, it's a conduit financing is really all it is. But it is a political subdivision of the county. Uh, and if you create it and we go to issue debt, we'll have to get a new tax ID number with for it. Okay. Um, I know that um, Betty, and there's been several others who have been looking at like the financing for the Expo Center project. And mm -hmm. I know we have a presentation, I think, coming up December 11th on the design for the um, for the Expo Center. So again, this is just in anticipation of and getting us ready for um, that project. That's so. correct. We've had meetings between Jim and I and Betty right. and the bankers at Emeritus, John MacArthur, who's crunched, I don't know, three sets of numbers or four, yeah. so, so that there's an idea of if we borrow 30 plus, then the interest cost is why, and if we can get the interest cost down, maybe we can borrow 30 million more or just get the, put, put the idea is to get as much into the project and the least amount into the interest payments. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Additional okay. questions? Yeah. I'll I'll move, go ahead. I'll move for acceptance of the resolution. I will second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Oppose no motion carries three to zero. Thank, Thank you, you for your well. work on You're this. Welcome. Next item, please. I'm going to see Sheriff's Office number one acknowledge receipt of correspondence from Sheriff Jones regarding replacement of 20 radar units at a total cost of $58,290 with funding from the 2017 budget. Good morning, Commissioners. Captain morning. Hubler with the Sheriff's Office. Uh, this request is to replace 20 of our aged uh, radar units. Um, it's something that we continually try to keep updated. Repair costs um, go up as, as the <coughs> units become more aged and just make sure we have good functioning radars in our units. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. I don't have any questions. questions uh, this is the second purchase of uh, a batch of radar units? Correct. This is the second installment. The first one was 20 as well. Um, that'll get us up to, to 40. Um, try and keep uh, a good working radar in all of our patrol units. Will we anticipate any more radar purchases before the end of the year? Uh, no. All right. I'll move to acknowledge receipt of the correspondence from the sheriff. I'll second. Motion made uh, by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Buer. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item C2 has been pulled. Item C3, acknowledge receipt of correspondence from Sheriff Jones regarding the purchase of a quad, quadcopter and accessories for the crime scene investigation unit at a total of $32,581 with funding from the 2017 budget. Good morning again, Commissioners. Uh, Sergeant Eric Coffin is here and would be happy to answer any questions you may have regarding this purchase. Morning, Commissioner. Sergeant Coffin with the Sheriff's Office Crime Scene Unit. Uh, the, the quadcopter is also known as a drone or an uh, unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, we're looking to purchase that uh, for a multi-divisional use across the Sheriff's Office for applications in, in regards to crime scene forensic mapping as well as search and rescue, uh, some tactical, tactical applications as well. Um, uh, the, it's a sole source through uh, a local vendor by the name of about attack who's based out of Billard Airport um, <clears throat> and that's already gone through the finance department and been signed by Betty Griner. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? I don't, I don't think that you know in the world that we live in this is a, a needed necessity anymore. It helps as one more tool in the toolbox for the sheriff but 
Um, as far as the cost goes, I mean, if I went out to Best Buy and bought one for a couple hundred bucks. Uh, the the $32,000 is, is an all-encompassing package to include the actual material, the, the drone itself. Um, there's also a FLIR camera, also known as thermal imaging. Uh, that's a substantial cost in and of itself. That's $10,000. Uh, the software that has to go with the drone in order to interpret all of the information that it does record and allow us to render two-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, diagrams of, of the, the footage uh, is a perpetual license in the amount of $8,700 as well. Uh, but that's a, a one-time singular cost that we'll never have to, to do anything else with in, in regards to updates. Uh, additionally, there's uh, some extra costs uh, for COA, FAA licensure, um, assistance to go through that process. Uh, as well as some on-site training and localized uh, standby and maintenance for the drone should we have any issues. I don't have any technical questions. <laughs> you covered all that, but I do have a question. It does mention in the memos uh, that it's been the sole source uh, form has been signed by Audit Finance, but I don't see Betty's signature on it, but I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that that has... Okay. All right. That's all I... Okay. And I understand that TPD has two drones. <laughs> uh, uh, are we duplicating point, uh, service in this area? Um, TPD has one operable drone at this point in time, and they've also went ahead and utilized uh, the, the same vendor that we're looking at. Um, <clears throat> with the, the equipment that we're looking at matches pretty much exactly what they have. Okay. Um, and we've also coordinated with uh, the operators of their drone program over at the police department to, to offer us some additional assistance should we need it. Okay. And they're satisfied with uh, the product and the service they've received? Yes. Okay. I'll move to acknowledge receipt. <coughs> Second. <coughs> Motion made to acknowledge receipt by Commissioner Mueller, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries 3 to 0. Thank you, Sergeant. Next Thank item, you. please. Item D, Parks and Recreation, number one, consider authorization and execution of contract C-426-2017 with Topeka Shawnee County Public Library, <coughs> excuse me, extending contract C-771-2012 and C-381-2013 through November of 2019 for continued support for programming and services in community centers at a cost of $37,250 in 2018 and $37,753 in 2019 with funding from Parks and Recreation operating budgets. Good morning, Commissioners. Susan Fowler Hansel with Parks and Rec. Um, the agreement today is an extension of the original memo of understanding from 2012. Um, at that time, the Topeka Shawnee County Public Library did purchase 40 computers and six printers and um, set up, along with working with our IT department, set up um, computer labs at six of our community centers. These. Uh, the fees for these, for the 50% of the service support, are paid, break down to about $478 per center for each month. Uh, the library gives us monthly reports on those uh, recording the usage forum. We get that both with the number of sessions that are signed on at each center along with the average time signed on to each center and also the total hours. Those have um, averaged out this year that the patrons have used those computer labs almost 5,000 hours by the end of this year. So they are being well used. They're used by adults for things like resumes, um, job looking for jobs uh, going out online reading their email using it for their social media but also checking out the job <coughs> opportunities and things like that the kids the youth after school use those computer labs quite a bit we have a lot of usage in the evenings too by the entire family um, one thing that I had noticed with the monthly reports that Thad Hartman sends us is that as you guys have approved in the past a few more partnerships in the community centers, we have started to see a few increases in those community centers. Um, Oakland Community Center is one where we've added two new partnerships here just recently, both the Topeka Community Cycle Project and the Heartland or the um, Harvester Mills. And we've actually seen this last year 91% increase in those computer labs. So I think all the partnerships that we are doing are really starting to pay off. We have some great new staff in the community centers. And I'm just really proud and excited mm -hmm. about 
looking at numbers like that and seeing that our centers are being more used and that the computer lab is part of that. Uh, the uh, technician that we pay 50% of the service support for, we have had no complaints. Um, <coughs> the technician comes around every just comes in to check on them but also responds very quickly when we do need any service and so for those fees we would not be able to offer this kind of computer lab to the public um, without this opportunity this has also led us to work with the library in many different ways uh, we host in our parks the learn and play bus the adventure mobiles things like that um, the learn and play has been about a hundred and four preschool programs in the, our parks over the last year um, coming a couple times a week to two of them and then we've also worked with them they've offered 84 programs at our community centers so it's just been a great partnership and we developed quite a bit beyond just the computer labs with that so today also um, with us is uh, Gina Millsap I wanted to give her an opportunity to come up and um, let you know a little bit of their side of this partnership and then I'll let her introduce David and Thad over here too. Okay. Thank you for coming. I'll scoot behind you. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. morning. Uh, let me introduce my colleagues, if I may. Uh, David King, who is head of, of our digital services director, and Thad Hartman, who is our community and strategic services manager. So um, I feel that at this point, um, uh, Shawnee County, especially Parks and Recreation, and the Public Library are joined at the hip. Um, I, I think it's 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 a relationship that's working quite well and is allowing both of us to extend our reach, leverage our resources, um, and we're giving a good deal to the taxpayers, but also increasing the quality of the services to our constituencies, which is one that we share uh, since both uh, Parks and Recreation and the Library serve all of Topeka and Shawnee County. I want to extend my thanks to all of you and for your leadership and your willingness to try this. It was an experiment, wasn't it? Um, and we found that it's been a very successful one. Um, I also wanted, in addition to all the wonderful uh, usage that we're seeing, um, I also want to point out that all of you are aware that I also serve on the Community Broadband Task Force that was convened by Mayor Wolgask and Commissioner Bueller. And um, this is really fulfilling one of our primary goals, which is to reduce that digital divide in our community. Uh, many of the people who use the computer labs and the community centers don't have the resources um, for a computer for to pay for internet access. So as we look at looking for a job, looking for a better job, improving uh, really for workforce development, improving their technology skills, for children to be able to do their homework, and virtually every school district now in our county requires an access to a computer to be able to do your homework and do research. Um, I think we're making inroads into reducing that digital divide. Um, I'll also take this opportunity. I know Pat Oblander has left, but he and I are working on the project management for the Community Broadband Task Force. And again, that is a very valuable partnership um, and benefits both the county and, and the library and the community. So thank you. And we have Mark from the city of Topeka. Mark Biswell is, is actually Mark our, our project lead as well. Don't want to leave anybody out. Yeah. Uh, him. Yeah. No, um, and and actually Patrick Clear, who is uh, the um, IT director for Auburn Washburn School District, is on it, and uh, Barbara Stapleton of uh, Go Topeka. So I think we got a pretty good group. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask is mm -hmm. I, I noticed in the, the memorandum that we had 84 classes. Mm -hmm. during this year how many participants did we have in those classes did you keep track of that we do have that I don't know if we, that do we have the data for that we I, you know I, it's not up here but we will find out for you okay. how's that I, yeah, we'll I, get that information and certainly any other data you want mm -hmm. um, we both tend to be very data driven um, because that's really one way we assess the value of what we're doing and so we can certainly expand our reporting if that will be helpful to you we're very data driven too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for Gina? No. May I also just recognize Betty Greiner, uh, who is uh, <laughs> while is uh, works uh, here, but also serves on my board and is one of my bosses. <laughs> so we really appreciate her leadership <laughs> and her support and participation as well. Very good. So thank very you. Good. Thank yeah. you, Gina. Thank you for being here. Yeah, definitely. Appreciate <clears throat> it. I'll move for approval of the contract. 
second. Motion made to approve the contract by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item. Thank you, please. Commissioners. Thank you, sir. Item D2, consider authorization and execution of contract C427-2017 with Special Olympics Kansas to host the 2018 Polar Plunge at Lake Shawnee Swim Beach on February 3rd, 2018 with expenses offset by a $500 special event fee and a donation of no less than $250 from the Parks and Recreation Foundation. Good morning, Commissioner. Sean Osborne, Parks and Recreation. This is a special use uh, event that we've done many years. Um, it's held out at Lake Shawnee, and I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have on the event part of it. Any questions or comments? Uh, I mean, they are us? looking for a political official to kind of lead the charge. <laughs> in, I did it last February. year. I think it's Commissioner yeah. Mueller's <laughs> turn. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? I'll, I'll move to approve the contract. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. <coughs> All in favor say aye. Oppose no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item D3, consider authorization and execution of contract C428-2017 with the Shawnee County Girls Softball Association, extending contract C171-2015 for an additional three years to allow for continued support of softball activities and programmings to young girls with funding from the Parks and Recreation <laughs> Operating Budget. Again, Sean Osborne, Parks and Recreation. Uh, before you is this group provides a lot of service back to our sports division. Um, it has worked well in the past. Um, last year, to give you a little bit, this, this past year we had 36 teams um, that participated, which is up from a year before. Um, they do a lot of our scheduling. They take a lot of the phone calls from different parents and coaches and help us with scheduling and different things of that nature. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, in reviewing this, I didn't see a fiscal note. Uh, what are the, what's the budgetary impact? Uh, with, within what they do for us? Yes. Is, it, is there a cost to the county? Uh, how does the operation work? No, the, the board actually participates, and they do a lot of this as volunteers. We do uh, not pay the individuals. Okay. 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 Good to know. Comments or questions? I'll move for approval of the contract. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Thank, Thank you, Sean. You. Next item, please. Item E, facilities maintenance. Number one, consider approval of request to submit a request for pricing for custodial services at the Courthouse North Annex Elections Office and two health department locations. Good morning, Commissioners. Bill Crow, facilities maintenance director. Um, <coughs> our contract with our current provider, Dream Team, uh, will be coming to a conclusion for the one-year contract we did with them at the end of January. So we want to go forward to get an RFP for custodial services at the locations that were mentioned. Uh, we did meet with uh, a lot of the uh, occupants of, of especially this building to get some input on what they think needs to be in that RFP. And we edited the, the new RFP to include a lot of the uh, concerns that our employees had. So hopefully we'll get some good responses and some good prices and be able to make a selection and move forward with contractual service for custodial. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Commissioners, any questions? questions. Mr. Crow? I'm going to approve the request. Second. Motion made to approve the request by Commissioner Bueller, and that was seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor, say aye. Oppose, no. Motion carries 3-0. <coughs> Thank, Thank you, Bill. Next item, please. Item F, Public Works Solid Waste Number 1, consider approval of change order number 1, final, to contract C-286-2017 with R.D. Johnson Excavation, adjusting the as-bid quantities to as-constructed quantities, resulting in a decrease of $7,113. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Tom Block with Public Works and Solid Waste. This project um, was done, um, or we administered this project on behalf of Boltmeyer Homes, who was in the fourth phase of their construction of Timber Ridge subdivision. And Timber Ridge subdivision is essentially located about a quarter mile east of the intersection of uh, Southwest 53rd and Wanamaker. Um, we are working with Doltmeyer Homes in which the, the county has provided the financing and then Doltmeyer Homes is going to be, or will, all these lots will be assessed that will reimburse the county for the cost that we've 
that we've bonded. Uh, the product is uh, now complete for, the, and this is just for the, uh, uh, just for the streets. He, uh, there was, he provided all the financing for the sewers that were constructed. But the product is now complete for the streets, and the final quantities have been uh, accounted for. And the result, um, after everything has been accounted, is a decrease, as mentioned, of seven thousand one hundred thirty-three dollars. And so this change order reflects that change in the contract. So it was our recommendation um, that this change order be approved. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I don't have any questions now. I'll move approval. Second. Motion made to approve by Commissioner Bueller, seconded by Commissioner <laughs> Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item F2, consider approval of resolution 2017-78, authorizing the placement and maintenance of speed limit signs along Northwest Carlson Road. Uh, commissioners, let me open up a uh, <coughs> photograph here, uh, <coughs> image. Get open. This image here, um, since the Willard Bridge has been opened um, and, and traffic patterns are now uh, beginning to reestablish themselves back to what they were uh, prior to the weight limits being imposed um, on the old bridge, uh, Public Works went out and conducted a traffic and speed study along the, the roadway. Um, along with Northwest Carlson Road, essentially beginning at Northwest 33rd um, and all the way down south towards the interstate. And based on the speed study and engineering judgment considerations, um, we are recommending uh, the attached resolution uh, regarding the speed limits um, uh, for this section of roadway. What we have here on the bottom, in the yellow line, the thin yellow line here is what is currently existing. And just north of Northwest uh, 33rd is 50 miles per hour as you head towards, towards Rossville until you get to those hairpin curves. From that point, as you head southwards towards the bridge and through Willard and basically to Ross Road is 35 miles per hour. And then from Ross Road um, to Interstate 70 is currently uh, 50 miles per hour. What we are recommending is what's shown in red here. Um, now beginning again at Northwest 33rd, um, we, would, we are recommending that it be increased from 35 miles per hour to 50 miles per hour. Um, to the north end of the Carl of the new of the new Willard Bridge, at that point, we're recommending that it be reduced across the bridge to 40 miles per hour. So it would be an increase of five miles per hour from what it currently is now across the bridge from 35 <coughs> miles per hour to 40 miles per hour. As we get to the to the south end of the bridge and starting to enter into the uh, town of Willard, we recommend that we remain at 35 miles per hour as it currently is. And then um, we recommend that we increase it when we reach a point uh, 450 <coughs> feet south of, of 2nd Street in Willard from 35 up to 50 all the way to the interstate. That is in, uh, it's in accordance with the 85th percentile of, of traffic, but also um, looking at some, like I said, engineering judgment considerations. Uh, the traffic study indicated that we should have a higher speed limit through the town of Willard. Um, I'm not comfortable with that, with just the amount of intersections and potential, potential for pedestrians. Um, so we're recommending that we keep it at, at 35 miles per hour as we enter, as we go through the town of Willard. So this resolution that's before you uh, reflects the, the recommendations uh, based on the information we gathered is part of the, the traffic study um, and speed study. And also I do want to point out, we looked at the striping as far as no, no passing zones along this stretch. And it is our recommendation that the current striping is, um, is sufficient and adequate for what, um, uh, what we believe it should be. And we recommend no changes to the striping. So if there's any questions um, regarding that, I'd be sure happy to answer them. Commissioner Bueller. 
Tom, you mentioned no concerns on striping just within that area, or did you look further south um, from? We went Miller. all the way, oh, went all the way to, to, the the interstate. to the interstate. Yeah, okay. so the, the I, I believe there was a there was some questions brought up about the valley that right. goes through, right. and um, that is currently a no passing zone, and there are a lot of driveways um, coming onto that stretch of roadway, and the distance the distance that you have with the speed um, we don't. And with the driveways that are all coming onto the road, we don't believe it would be uh, very wise to uh, put a, a passing zone in that area. Okay. And in the distance, you may have enough time to make a p to pass, um, and that's all fine and dandy for who's driving on the road. But if someone's coming out onto the road from their driveway, they not, may not be able to. Um, really uh, interpret how fast that car is coming towards them as they pull out into the roadway. So that's why we recommend leaving it as a no passing zone. When would this go into, when would we get the signs posted and it would go into effect then, the changes in the speeds? Yeah, as soon as, uh, if, if the commission agrees with this, we would, uh, we would have them up um, maybe, well, I'm trying to think if we've got any, I don't know if we've done locates yet. For the signs, if we have to, if we we yeah, we have to relocate some signs. But as soon as we get the locates done, they would be up as soon as as soon as we get those Good. get that done. So I would say for certain by mid next week. Okay, I know that there has been quite a few questions about the speeds in that area, and kept telling them we're we're looking at it, we're looking at it. So this is this is the result. I don't have any questions. Neither do I. I don't know if there's anyone wanting to comment on the item or not. Does anyone want to speak for this issue? Well, I do want to note to the public that I do know the City of Rossville uh, Police Department monitors this um, mm -hmm. quite regularly. Um, so drive accordingly. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Exactly. <laughs> he wasn't looking at me. No. no, 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 no. <laughs> It's it's tough to go 35 on the bridge when you're going north because it yeah. slopes down yeah. now. So you really have to kind of put the brakes on when you're going north, and I've done that. Um, but yeah, I, um, the city of Rossville contracts with the city of Willard for police protection. Oh, okay. So that's why the city of Rossville is out there doing that. They have a they have an agreement. Agreement. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Yep. So. I'll move approval of the or to adopt the resolution. Second. Motion made to adopt the resolution by Commissioner Bueller, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries three to zero. Thank you very Thank you. much, Tom. Good job. Next item, please. Item G, County Councilor Number One, consider approval of Resolution Number 2017-79, establishing that Shawnee County is not a sanctuary county. Good morning, Commissioners. Jim Crow, <laughs> County Counselor. If you'll indulge me for a little bit before we consider the resolution, I want to discuss background information on the resolution, why it's being proposed, and, and provide some information on this <coughs> issue because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And um, there's a lot of politics surrounding this issue. Um, <laughs> And there's a lot of people nervous about it because of our our own staff but our own partners in law enforcement and otherwise that do receive federal funding so the fear of losing that federal funding is always out there um, so I want to talk about what is a sanctuary jurisdiction and and I want to disclose where I'm headed from right from the beginning it's not Shawnee County and we're going to go ahead and propose to affirm that through the resolution <coughs> today um, I'm not going to read this verbatim verbatim this comes from Wikipedia and you can go online and find different de definitions but really a, a sanctuary city or county or jurisdiction is one that has either issued a formal policy or through their actual practice uh, in some way limits their cooperation or communication with federal immigration officials. Um, a lot of major met metropolitan cities, as you know, <laughs> have adopted formal policies um, directing their law enforcement 
uh, staff not to communicate with ICE, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement Officers. That's the typical <coughs> understood meaning of what is a sanctuary city or county. Um, if you go through at Wikipedia, you'll see that Berkeley, California, which is no surprise, was the first U.S. city to pass a sanctuary resolution in 1971. And I, and I include this point to show that this issue's been around for a long time. Um, and, and over the years since 1971, different municipalities have adopted these types of issues. It's only recently that it's come to the forefront as a political issue. Um, in reaction to these policies, there are some states like Texas and North Carolina that have actually passed state laws prohibiting cities and counties from becoming sanctuary jurisdictions. So the issue goes back and forth. Um, this really came to the forefront because on July 1st of 2015, a uh, 32 year old Catherine Steinle was shot and killed by a Mexican <coughs> national who was in the country illegally in San Francisco. And as we know, San Francisco had a sanctuary policy in place at that time. That really ignited the issue as a national political issue and put focus on the sanctuary policies across the country. Um, following the election of President Trump, one of his first acts as president was to issue an executive order on this issue. And so on, on January 25th of 2017, he issued an executive order titled Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States. And section one of the order explains its <coughs> purpose and it provides sanctuary jurisdictions across the United States willfully violate federal law in an attempt to shield aliens from removal from the United States. These jurisdictions have caused immeasurable harm to the American people and to the very fabric of the Republic. Um, I include this discussion in detail of the executive order for one reason, and that's because in reality, <coughs> we can talk about different def definitions that you find in Wikipedia or elsewhere on the internet, but the only actual legal definition of what is a sanctuary jurisdiction can be found in this executive order. And in reality, that definition is, is narrow. Um, it, it specifically references um, that state or a political subdivision of <coughs> state shall comply with 8 U.S.C. 1373. That is what uh, the federal government now focuses on as what is a sanctuary uh, jurisdiction. And Section 9A is the one that brought up the issue of the possibility of jurisdictions that meet that definition could face uh, defunding, uh, federal defunding in, in different areas. So it's only those jurisdictions that willfully refuse to comply with 8 U.S.C. 1373. So what is this, what is this statute required? <coughs> and it's titled Communication Between Governmental Agencies and the Immigration and Naturalization Service. That's the, this was passed back in the 90s. We now know that federal agency as ICE. Section A requires that notwithstanding any other provision of the law, a federal, state, or local governmental entity or official may not prohibit or in any way restrict any government, government entity or official from sending to or receiving from the Immigration and Naturalization Service information regarding the citizenship or immigration status, lawful or unlawful, of any individual. So this statute requires communication. It doesn't require cooperation, it requires communication. Um, following the is issuance of the uh, executive order, there have been a couple of uh, press releases by the Department of Justice focusing in on their review of various jurisdictions 
um, across the country that qualify as a sanctuary under the ex executive order's definition for violation of that statute. This one was the, the most recent um, statement made on those jurisdictions as of October 12th of 2017. Uh, you'll note that Shawnee County is not on this list. It's actually a fairly, fairly narrow list because it's a fairly narrow definition. These are the jurisdictions that the Department of Justice are now signaling are at risk if they don't change policies that they have in effect from loss of federal funding. So what about Shawnee County? Shawnee County has not adopted a policy that is prohibited by 8 U.S.C. 1373. Not before this issue uh, became political and, and not after. Um, Shawnee County officials and employees, and I've been working with Brian Cole at the Department of, of uh, Corrections and our staff to be very clear on what we do and how we do it and how we communicate with ICE. And um, I can confidently state that um, both before and after the executive order, <coughs> our employees have been complying with 8 U.S.C. 1373. We do communicate. Finally, we have not appeared on any of the lists that other jurisdictions appear on when they are going to be threatened for sanctions or loss of federal funding. So here's the proposed resolution. It's pretty simple and pretty direct. Um, it simply states that um, it acknowledges that U.S. Congress has enacted 8 U.S.C. 1373. It requires, uh, as do our oaths require, that we all take, uh, that we shall observe and um, honor the U.S. Constitution, the state of Kansas Constitution, and the laws and the decisions of our courts. We're going to honor the rule of law, and that's what we do in Shawnee County. Um, it also makes clear that unless that statute, 8 U.S.C. 1373, is repealed or declared unconstitutional, that as a matter of official policy, Shawnee County officials and employees shall comply with that statute, which won't be difficult because they already comply with that statute. And that's the resolution. Uh, the intent behind this would be to be able to provide it to websites, perhaps, that have us listed as a sanctuary jurisdiction or to media partners that have questions about it, just so we can have something that's clear as policy from Shawnee County to make it clear that um, we have not set an official policy um, to make ourselves become a sanctuary jurisdiction and to make it clear to our partners in the community that we are not actually at risk for loss of funding. And I'll be happy to answer any additional questions you might have. Questions for the county counselor? Excellent presentation. Thank you, Jim, for putting so much work into yeah. that. Um, that was excellent. I don't have any questions. I do have one question, and I noticed that uh, Councilman Cohen is here this morning. What would what would be the impact if the city of Topeka passed an ordinance that declared it a sanctuary city? It would only impact city staff. It would not impact county staff. It would not reach to county staff. Only you can direct policy that would affect how Director Cole and his employees would do business <coughs> and communicate with ICE. So if the city enacted a policy, that would be directed at Topeka Police Department or city staff only. <coughs> Very good. Commissioner Cook? It would be nice to finally put this issue to rest yeah. and so that the media <coughs> and our partners of the paper know that we are <coughs> a sanctuary county. Uh, this is an issue we've had to bring up about every three months mm -hmm. for the last mm -hmm. almost two years. Mm -hmm. So if we can finally put this issue to rest, that would be nice. Here, here. And I've heard not only from media, but just concerned members of the public sure. who follow this <coughs> issue. It's, it's a very prominent political issue, and there's a lot of people concerned about it. Uh, yes, thank you for your fine work on this. Mm -hmm. It is deeply appreciated, and I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution. I'll second. 
Motion made to approve by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no motion carries three to zero. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Next item, please. Item H, Administrative Services, number one, consider approval of resolution number 2017-80, adopting the Shawnee County Fund Balance Policy. Good morning. Betty Greiner, Director of Administrative Services, here with a uh, proposed fund balance policy. And uh, I will go through this in, in some detail because I think this is a, an important issue. Um, as you know, the Commission um, must account for public funds, manage county finances wisely, and maintain adequate fund reserves in case of unforeseen events. I believe that a fund balance policy will provide a structure for this and um, also uh, help us with un uh, reduce any fiscal or financial risk. The, um, the county must have adequate reserves <coughs> to provide for daily cash flow needed for our services, to continue county services during a natural, disa natural disaster, whether that be a, a flood or a tornado um, or any other type of disaster. You know, FEMA funds may be um, available, but they're not immediate. Um, they also uh, cover what is, can be documented. Mm -hmm. um, we also need to secure and maintain a favorable uh, bond rating. As we all know, the better the bond rating, the lower the interest costs for our financing. We need to provide a rainy day fund for economic downturns and revenue <coughs> shortfalls. The, uh, re the recession that we had really showed us how um, revenue shortfalls can use uh, reserves. And this last recession was a very good example of that. If the county had not gone into that with good reserves, that would have had a, a much uh, more impact, a uh, bigger impact on the county. And uh, along with that, uh, tax delinquencies increase in any type of economic downturn, which has a dramatic effect. We need to provide funds for unforeseen emergencies. Uh, we also need to be able to provide funds for unfunded mandates. Those mandates could come from federal or state governments, either one, and to <coughs> offset eliminated or reduced revenue from other governmental bodies, which again could be federal or state. So I want to go over the process uh, that we went through um, for this policy that I'm recommending. First of all, it was a lengthy process and involved um, many people. I looked back to when uh, this process started and we began it in March. So, uh, but we didn't want to rush it. We wanted to take our time. We wanted to, to um, include all the people that needed to be consulted and included in this uh, to, to do it right, to, to get that right balance um, in, in where, where, where we think we need to be. So the process included, uh, first of all, researching governmental um, accounting resources and I will go through those um, and what I found in those. Also researching policies of other um, municipalities to see what they have as policies. Um, also to look at the needs of each type of funds that the county has. The county has many types of funds and I will go through those, um, but we needed to look at each fund individually to what type of a balance that fund needs. They each have distinct uses and needs and, and they needed to be looked at individually. Then um, <coughs> after a draft had been uh, created, that draft was shared um, for input by uh, the Shawnee County departments especially those like the, the health department has its own um, special revenue fund. They needed to be consulted on that. Um, solid waste with the, the enterprise fund, that type of thing. And then after that input, uh, the draft was shared with the counselor's office and with the commissioners individually to get their input. Then all of that uh, input was, was uh, the, the policy was revised for that input and then this, has, this is the finished product. So I will, I mentioned the, the research I did into the uh, resources, different uh, resources, 
and I will go through those. Uh, the first resource I'll talk about is the GFOA, which is Government Finance Officers Association. This, is, uh, this association, they really set the, the best practices for governmental accounting. Um, they suggest that the minimum reserve should be no less than two months of revenues or expenses. Now, it doesn't give the method for calculating those two months um, because it could be just calculated as two twelfths. You know, you could be looking at two months that way, or you could look at the two highest consecutive months. So uh, we'll look at that too, but they don't, they don't uh, recommend a method for that. Um, it also states that an enterprise fund should maintain an, an appropriate level of working capital. I also looked at GASB, which is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Now this is the board that sets our auditing standards. <coughs> um, the uh, GAP <coughs> accounting standards, which GAP is general accepted accounting principles, um, they set these GAP standards <coughs> for governmental accounting. Ref uh, GASB actually references the GFOA and their recommendation, and they um, also recommend a minimum of no less than two months of revenues or expenditures. And again, they don't give a method of, of how to calculate those two months. Then I looked at the Office of Management and Budget, their uh, uniform guidance for federal grants. This is a federal agency for grant administration for federal grants. They uh, recommend three months of expenditures. As you know, we have some significant grants uh, the, the WIC program for the health department, uh, the uh, Parks and Rec has uh, several grants that, that they use. Um, <coughs> so we need to make sure that we are, you know, with, in line with those because we certainly want to maintain those, those uh, grants. Then I also looked at Moody's Investor Services. They are a bond rating service. In uh, December 16th of 2016, they published rating methodology U.S. local government general obligation <coughs> debt. And one of the factors they use in their ratings is the finance factor. Under their finance factor, they show the, um, the rates that they look at and how they rate the <coughs> reserve levels of the uh, <coughs> entities that they are, are rating. For a triple A rating, which is very strong, they want uh, reserves to be greater than 30%. For a double A rating, which is a strong, which is a strong rating, they want reserves of 15 to 30 percent. A A rating is a moderate rating, that would be reserves of 5 to 15 percent, and a BAA rating, which is a weak rating, would be reserves up to 5 percent. So I looked at all of these sources and um, came up with. Came up with <laughs> uh, different ratings. Oop, now I went too far. Now let's see if I can go back. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I looked at each different type of fund, and I'm going to go through each different type of fund. As I said, they have different purposes and, and so we need to look at them individually. This chart shows the, all the different types of funds and what I am recommending. The first one is the general fund. When, the, the, when most of us think of the county's reserves, we think of the general <coughs> fund. This is basically the operating fund of the county. Uh, this is what we is budgeted each August for the next year. This covers the majority of the county uh, departments. What I'm suggesting is a reserve minimum of 20%. Now, I, I said that before the recommendation was at least two months and it didn't say how to calculate that. If you look at you know, two twelfths, that would be 17%. If you look at our highest two consecutive months in the year, which would be July and August, the last two years that's been 23%. So um, what I am recommending is 20%. I think that's kind of right 
in line, you know, in the middle of those two numbers. So I'm recommending 20% on that. Um, the reserve goal, which is the level we would strive to maintain, that I'm recommending at 25%. Uh, as I mentioned to you, grants want three, m three months of expenditure. <coughs> so three twelfths would be 25%. So that uh, is kind of where I came up with that. Now these percentages would be applied to budgetary accounting. You know, we've talked when we look at the audit that there's gap accrual and then there's budgetary accounting. These would be applied to the budgetary accounting reserves. And they would also be applied to the most recent approved budget that is approved by the Commission. The next type of fund <coughs> is the Special Revenue Fund, and these funds are restricted by use by a specific revenue source, like the Health Department has, you know, <coughs> just the revenue that comes in for those, those uh, I want to say, services that they provide. Um, and then it, it's restricted on what they can, that they can only be used for those types of, of expenditures. The, the Parks and Rec uh, revolving fund where we've put the golf courses and those, that revenue is specific, to, you know, to that fund and can only be used for those, those funds or those uses. On this, I'm <coughs> recommending a reserve minimum of the 20 percent for the same reasons as b above and the reserve goal as 25 percent, um, mainly for the same reason too, because these funds, especially the health department, does have grants and Parks and Rec also that we want to make sure we have the three months of expenditures that the grants um, want. These would also be applied, these percentages, to the most recent approved budget. The next type of fund is the capital project fund. Now this, in this case, the reserves only need to cover the costs of those projects that they're put in there for. You know, these are restricted for purchases or construction of capital assets. So, you know, there's not a, a need for a reserve other than those costs. <coughs> The next category is enterprise fund, and as I mentioned, the only enterprise fund the county has is the solid waste fund. These is a, this is a self-supporting fund from user fees, um, and so we have to look at this a little differently. I am still recommending a reserve minimum of 20%, 20, 20 uh, the goal of 25 percent, Tom and I did sit down and we talked this through and, and looked at all the different items. Um, you know, this fund needs to be self-sufficient. So it needs to be able to handle fluctuations, but it also needs to be able to handle if there were some large <coughs> capital needs that they needed at some point in time because of some disaster or, or something. So um, I'm recommending the same amounts. Theirs uh, would be applied to their net position. Now, this is an accounting term. Uh, since they are a enterprise fund, it's like a business fund. So what you're looking at for gap purposes is um, their assets less their liabilities. And their assets include all their trucks and, and all of that. Um, so this percentage would be applied to that net asset number. Next we have internal uh, <coughs> service funds and we have two of those. We have our health insurance fund. As you know we are self-insured. Our health plan for our employees is a self-insured fund. Um, in this <coughs> case I'm recommending that we have um, a reserve minimum of 25 percent and, and um, we need to cover, be able to cover large fluctuations in this account. This account um, can fluctuate greatly from one year to another. In looking back on in this and, and really researching it to come up with these amounts, in 2014 our expenses increased 19 percent and then in the next year, 2015, they increased 7 percent. So it's like, you know, we've got to be able to handle any of those fluctuations and sometimes it might be two years in a row and then we would have a lower rate you know year uh, after that but um, you know we've just got to be able to to cover those um, now this in this case I'm I'm 
I'm uh, recommending the 25% the minim, minimum and a 30% goal, um, but it wouldn't be on just the, the last year's expenses because, like I said, these fluctuate so much. So what I'm looking at that is I would look at the average of the prior five years. So if you look at that, that's a, a long enough term to kind of look at an average um, amount. So the 25 and the 30 percent would be applied to that five-year average. The uh, workers' comp fund, we are also self-insured for our workers' comp. That I'm recommending the 20 percent for the minimum and uh, a 25 percent for the goal because the fluctuations, we still have fluctuations, they're not quite as dramatic <coughs> as the fluctuations for the health insurance plan. So I think in this case that this should be able to cover the fluctuations we would have in the workers' comp fund. Um, so that kind of goes over the different recommendations I'm making for the, the reserve minimum and for the reserve goal. Now the policy also goes on um, to talk about the use of the reserves. If there's an excess fund balance, you know, that means it's over the goal, not over the minimum, but if it's over the goal that we want to maintain, what could those be used for? And uh, the first one is debt reduction. Now, there are constraints on that, that, that debt can only be paid down at, on call dates, you know, so there are some restrictions, but it could be used for debt reduction. It could also be used for one-time expenditures that do not increase operating costs and cannot be funded by revenue. You know, you, you don't want to spend it on a one-time expenditure that then you can't support in your the operating funds or the operating costs in your budgets in, in the future years. And you also want to look and if this is something that can be covered by revenue that's coming in before we look at the reserves. And the third is equipment replacement, capital projects, emergencies, or disaster recovery. Um, those are the uses that, uh, that are outlined in the policy. It also talks about a fiscal emergency that you as the commission can declare a fiscal emergency and use any amount of the reserves that are necessary, regardless of the, the um, minimum amount. And then it also lays out that if the, minim if the balance drops below the minimum, that the uh, commission will create and implement a plan to restore the, the reserves to the minimum within three years. Um, so that is my recommendation. I would be uh, happy to answer any questions. Other questions for Betty? Commissioner Cook? Well, I, I know that John Knight was very disappointed this morning. He thought this was going to be a discussion of a fund balance instead of a fund balance. <laughs> 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 but I, I think this is something that, you know, we're needing to move in that direction so that we can prepare for those unexpected mm. impacts. Um, it took us a long time to get our reserves back up. It takes just a little bit to wipe them out. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. I mean, Commissioner Bueller, you sat oh, yeah. through yeah. sometimes when we had Definitely. reserves and had none. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You've come a long way. Yes. Um, I, when Betty <coughs> was working on this, I shared with her, I can still remember when I first started on the commission that we didn't even receive uh, updates on expenditures and revenue every month. I mean, that's hard to believe, but we didn't. And so this is just another example of giving guidance to the commission. Um, we have flexibility still, but it's giving guidance. And so I think it's very important, very, very important. Great work, everybody who contributed. I know, I know it, t it took a, a while, but I think it's a very good policy. So thank you. Yeah, yeah excellent work. Excellent. I'll move to adopt the resolution. Second. Motion made to adopt the resolution by Commissioner Archer, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Three to zero. Somebody in the back yes. Is this an appropriate time to ask any questions? Come right on up. Thank you. 
I read this several times and I've listened to Mrs. Greiner. Um, is the bottom line of this that you're going to take the reserve money that we have now currently, the $33 million, and divide it among these funds? The, the $33 million that we currently have is, is the fund for the general fund only. And, and this would not move any money at all. It's just setting guidelines mm -hmm. for uh, where we want those, those levels to be. Uh, the general fund is the one that has the, the $33 million at the end of last year. Um, and, and I don't think in the audit uh, report we really went into the balance of the other funds. It's in the audit report, you know, what those <coughs> other funds are, but we really didn't go into those in detail. Um, but this would not be moving any money at all. It's all, you know, it, it's, they are in the funds. It's just setting those, those amounts that we would like to see maintained. So we're going to continue to have, we're going to continue to add money to the general fund and increase it to whenever. But we're also going to have these general funds and, or these other funds, excuse me, and we're going to add up to 25% excess dollars there. Is, am I reading that right? No, these other, these other funds currently have their own reserves now. This is there again, just setting what, what level we would like those reserves to be uh, maintained at. They, they each fund already has their own reserves and will have, and, and most, all of, most of those other <coughs> funds, I believe, are, are pretty close to what you know, we're, we're wanting them to be at. Um, it, this is not maintaining or transferring anything from one fund to another. These are all already funds we have. It's just setting levels that we would like their reserve levels to be at. Betty, if I might, mm -hmm. it, this might help, Carol. Yeah. So if Shawnee County was to look at its general fund balance, and the general fund reserve is the largest out of all of our reserves. Yes. If setting a policy or just a, um, a general admonition amongst the commissioners that we would not fall below 20% and that we would maintain at least 25% of that last year's general mm -hmm. um, budget amount. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to have 30%, let us say our cash reserves got up to 30%, then we would start to look at being able to free up that excess reserves to do other things with. Absolutely. Yes. So this is putting us on a trajectory where we have excess funds, identifying that we can use those excess funds for other needs the county may have, whether it's deferred maintenance, capital improvement, or those sorts of things. It, it lays out what those reserves can be used for, yes. but it also <laughs> kind of sets, like you said, an amount that you have that is available to to look at being used. Yeah. And, but that would be a decision to be made by the commission yes. in an open meeting, taking a public comment and discussing it uh, comprehensively. Sure. Okay. Well, if I understand, if, <clears throat> if I'm hearing what you say, each of these funds have reserve money in them. That is correct. Yes. But then we also have this fund which doesn't have a name of 33 million in it in addition to these other funds with their reserve money in it no okay correct. the 33 million is your general fund it has okay. a name general, general fund, fund. Reserve. okay reserve. so the 33 million is in the general fund well then that leads us to the question if the general fund if mrs griner's um, recommendation is 25 percent we have by far exceeded the 25 percent. Shouldn't we be putting that back into the county? Again, that's a decision for the commission to make in an open hearing uh, and taking input from the public on how we're going to when and if and how much of the reserve we intend to spend. But we as taxpayers are paying those dollars in and we get no services from them. I mean, I, I have stated up here before, I, I believe we need a reserve fund, but I think we have all, in my opinion, exceeded it 
to what is needed. I don't think well, that then, then I think we'll have to respectfully disagree uh, because if one incident, one natural disaster, not only cost us money uh, as far as operational, but it takes assessed value off the tax rolls. Think about it. Think about if a, a tornado or, or a hurricane, something came and uh, wiped out our community or 10% of it, not only would we have emergency to spend money, but we would lose that property tax assessment. Well, I mean, that's very, very important to us. But I think we're all on the same page, though. Mm. I mean, Ms. Marple and the commission, it may be a first that we're on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> it, that this policy identifies that the county would have at least 20 with a goal of having 25 and when we hit that 25 percent mark then our audit finance director Ms. Griner would say congratulations commissioners you've got 25 percent <coughs> we're out at 27 percent we have these funds what would we these are needs we would have a meeting, Ms. Marple, on those needs and identify where those excess funds are going to be spent. But have so, we not met that? So that, we're here. That's what we're doing That's today. A, and, and, but we then not only have, we have, we've met the minimum, we've met the goals, but we also now have put a policy in place for this body to spend those well, excess funds if, if we choose to do that mm -hmm, right. versus one person just not that this could happen just sweeping uh those reserves and, and placing them somewhere else exactly. that is this body that then makes that decision but in the past the commission did not have a policy we did not have a policy and the commission had spent far below the 20 percent mm -hmm. um and again there were reasons why it exactly. happened but this is to set a Slays future precedent but this is to set a future precedent for commissioners that follow you know past Mm -hmm. um, this present body. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, Ms. Marple, what you might be asking is if there are excess funds above 25 percent, when might I see as a taxpayer a discussion of that? And I think that's your question that you're trying to ask, mm -hmm. is when am I going to see some of those excess funds being spent and where are they going to be spent at? Well, that is a good question, but you, you stated earlier that the 33 million is in the general fund correct yes correct yes. correct okay and you are not going to take any of the 33 million out to put in these other funds we can't okay so the 33 million the excess funds are going to continue to grow or not grow maybe you'll decide to spend some or is it going to be a policy that we have to wait until the other funds get up to the 20 or 25 percent. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe Ms. Brown might be able to answer. Yeah. Each fund is looked upon separately. They're segregated They're funds. They're segregated funds. Okay. And, and most of the mm -hmm. other funds are restricted in, in what they can be spent on and what they can be used on based on the information I went through that that their expenditures are are restricted so it's it's really just the general funds that we would look at spending the excess of if, if it would you know if it would be the the pleasure of the Commission very good so I guess Ms. Marple if our budget for Shawnee County was 100 million dollars mm -hmm. 25 percent of 100 million dollars is 25 million right right yes sir Okay. And so if Shawnee County had $27 million in reserves, mm -hmm. Ms. Griner would then approach the commission, identify that there are $2 million excess. We would then identify designated needs within the county and spend that $2 million or have the option, and I guess maybe stress, we have the option of spending that $2 million on okay. those dif identified needs discussed in an open meeting with feedback from the public mm -hmm. okay. so if we are above 25 percent today we're not saying today what we're spending that money on we haven't identified that and we haven't had that public discussion okay so that leads to my final question as i recall the budget was 103 million dollars so if 25 percent would be and i'm not going to do the math probably 27 million close to that you know, if you use the hundred hundred million, 
So you are at the 25 percent with the 33 million. So is there a point in time or a plan to discuss where that extra money will be spent or if it will be spent? Yes, and we have a policy to do that. Okay. So you are going to discuss at some given time? Yes. I think it will be shortly after the first of the year, to be honest with you. Okay. When we, okay. When we evaluate this year and see where we are financially uh, at the beginning of next year, I think we'll have that discussion. Again, it will be open to the public. We'll take public comment on how we spend tax dollars, and we'll move forward. Just as, and, and I don't really feel that it's necessary sometimes to share my personal uh, financial situation, but I, I did some figuring on my way up here. I got my taxes. I get my taxes in an 8 by 10 envelope. They don't, they don't come in a regular envelope. <clears throat> the place that I live at, which is 320 acres, I live in a house that was built in 1932. I have two buildings on it, which we house equipment or use as a shop, and I have an old garage. On that place, to live there, just to pay my taxes, I pay 10000 $750.88. Now, today a bushel of corn is worth approximately $3. We have to raise on our farm 3,583 bushels of corn just to pay the taxes on my, the place where we live. You know, I myself want to see taxes decrease. I think Yes, we need a reserve, no denying that. But I think the taxpayers need some relief. Thank you Thank for you. allowing me. Thank you for your comments. Next item, please. Item L, Commission Number 1, acknowledge receipt of notice of resignation from Greg Abbott as trustee of the Silver Lake Township. I'll move to acknowledge receipt of the notice of resignation from Greg Abbott um, and also ask that those who are interested submit their names and qualifications uh, by the end of business day, 5 o'clock on December 14th, so that we can um, hopefully get that on the agenda for December 18th. I know that's going to be kind of close, but um, hopefully we can get that done before the end of the year. Okay. So we've got some motion. Very good. Second. A motion made to acknowledge received by Commissioner Bueller, <laughs> seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor? Say aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. Item L2, discussion of legislative issues. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. Jim Crowell again. Two for the price of one presentation <laughs> day. <clears throat> Can you help me get out of this? There we go. I want to talk this morning about um, legislative issues for 2018, which I know this year has flown. It almost seems crazy at this point to talk about that. But in a blink of an eye, the legislature is going to be back in session. There's a lot of things getting ready to happen already. So it's, it's time to uh, think about the issues that are important to us and, and get a game plan together for that. Um, we cannot discuss the 2018 legislative session without discussing school finance. Um, and that's because this session is going to be dominated by school finance uh, to the exclusion of a lot of other things. So just to backtrack where we're at right now, on October 2nd, the Kansas Supreme Court issued its long-awaited decision on whether the 2017 Kansas legislature had adequately <coughs> funded K-12 through education, and the Supreme Court answered no, they had not. And um, in its 88-page decision, the court directed the Kansas legislature to adequately fund K-12 education or face the possibility of an order closing public schools on June 30th, 2018. And actually, they have less time than June 30th. Uh, there's a deadline in April for the parties to submit 
uh, additional briefs in the case to start arguing about what had been done at that point and, and whether it's adequate. So um, everyone that's been following the papers and the news understands this issue is going to dominate uh, the, the legislative session. I've been working with the KEC, uh, the Kansas Association of Counties, on its legislative agenda. Uh, I think the consensus from the Kansas Association of Counties is this is not a year to come forward to the legislature with a laundry basket full of issues. This is a year to identify three or four issues that are important to us and really focus on those issues. Um, that's what the KAC is going to do. That's what I recommend for us as well. And uh, the good thing about it is uh, we are in alignment with the KAC on the issues that they're going to pursue. So we're going to be working together um, I would recommend a narrow focus focusing on the issue of election office budgeting. Uh, there's a pending bill that I'll talk about a little bit on uh, making some adjustments to the tax lid legislation, uh, the Tobacco 21 issue. And um, we want to talk to the legislators about this dark store theory that's an appraisal theory that is um, looming, it has an ominous name to it, and it is fairly ominous as it looms in the background for what we do. First, um, on the issue of election office budgeting, the Board of County Commissioners, as you know, uh, sets the annual budgets for 21 different departments or offices for Shawnee County. Included in that is the election office. Um, during the last three budget cycles, the election commissioner has taken the position that the Board of County Com Commissioners must allocate the exact amount requested by him for his annual budget. Um, this position effectively removes oversight and control by the Board of County Commissioners over spending in the election office. Uh, this position uh, would set the election office apart from the other 20 departments that the Board of County Commissioners budgets for each year. Um, the Kansas Secretary of State, who appoints the election commissioner, requested and received an attorney general opinion that now supports um, the election commissioner's interpretation of the budgeting statute for him, which was no surprise. Um, last year, um, Mr. Rucker, who was a deputy secretary of state, said he would go and obtain this opinion. So it did not surprise us. Uh, just so that everyone knows, this isn't an isolated issue for Shawnee County. The Kansas Association of Counties opposes this same position. Um, the counties affected directly are the four counties that have an appointed election commissioner, and that's Shawnee, Sedgwick, Wyandotte, and Johnson County. Um, but all counties oppose it because, as the discussion was at the KC legislative policy agenda, um, I know the commissioner from Miami County, where I grew up, gave an impassioned speech about how um, Board of County Commissioners are the elected um, officials that are charged with the duty of budgeting and oversight and we should always uh, try to preserve that responsibility for the public and the taxpayers. So the KAC and Shawnee County will work, will work for legislative clarification that the Board of County Commissioners does have the authority to set and oversee the election office budget. We will be seeking legislation that will put the election office under the same budgeting rules as the other county departments. And that will be our message. We're looking for the same <coughs> formulation that only applies to apply to this office. We're not asking for anything over and above that or overly punity, but we just want the same um, authority in place that are for the rest of the county budgets. Okay, the tax lid. Um, as you know, the property tax lid was enacted <coughs> in 2015. Um, currently pending, there is um, how the tax lid works 
Um, there is a set of exemptions in that lid that exempts certain items from operation of the tax lid. There are certain draft uh, legislation pending that was sponsored by the Kansas Association of Counties that would exempt employee benefit increases from operation of the tax lid. Um, that's important to us and a fairly easy concept to sell to legislators because they understand that we have little control over the employee benefit costs, employee benefits costs uh, through health benefits, uh, through capers, uh, increases in costs of capers affect all municipalities. Um, it's a large uh, personnel costs are a, a significant portion of our budget. And so this is something that we think in a legislative session like this one, this is a doable um, thing to, to work for. Another piece of the tax lid law requires an, a, a, a full election process for a municipality if they are actually going to exceed the tax lid limit <coughs> for them. As many um, <coughs> different people have pointed out, that process wasn't well thought through it's expensive for the taxpayers. It's also impractical given the timing of the budget cycle each year and, and when you would have to hold an election. So many people have suggested and advocated for in substituting the election process with a protest uh, petition <coughs> process, um, which would be a lot less expensive, um, a lot more workable, and um, doable in that situation. Again, neither one of these suggestions is seeking to eliminate the tax lid, which is what we would prefer, but um, make the existing legislation more workable for us. Um, another issue that we want to focus on is Tobacco 21. In August, Shawnee County joined other Kansas local governments who have prohibited the sale of tobacco products to persons under the age of 21. This action was done in response to the county's drop in the annual health rankings, due in large part to the adult smoking rate in Shawnee County. Uh, studies show that 90% of all adult smokers begin smoking before the age of 21. Um, we expect a push on both sides of this. There will be a push to enact uh, Tobacco 21 statewide. There will also be a contrary push by lobbyists for tobacco interests and business interests to strike down local legislation like what Shawnee County has enacted um, to allow the sale across the state at age 21 to continue. Let me get to the dark store theory. Um, we want our legislators to be aware of a new appraisal theory that's uh, moving across the country called the dark store theory. Um, for background purposes, the law requires commercial and residential properties to be valued each year as of January 1st. So, so what is the condition of that property as of January 1st each year? That's what the law requires. The dark store theory is being argued by big box stores. So your stores like Best Buy, your Walgreens, um, these are national companies that go into communities and they, they build these um, structures to suit for their needs. If you've seen one Best Buy, you've seen it everywhere you go, Best Buy looks the same. Same way with Walgreens and other big box stores. Um, these stores argue that their buildings are built to suit them specifically and, and, and uniquely and have greatly reduced value on the open market when vacant. And so a dark store appraisal and, and what they receive in the appraisal is an, it, is an assumption that the store is vacant as of January 1st, which is actually false. Um, they're making this argument for existing operating stores and it typically assigns a fair market value based upon that assumption uh, that is less than half of what a normal conventional appraisal would be for the property. What's the problem with that? Well, if, it, if this 
theory takes hold in Kansas, and they're already arguing it in Kansas, and this will go through the courts in Kansas. Um, it would cause a substantial shift in the tax burden away from these box stores to other commercial and residential uh, taxpayers. Taxes are a zero-sum game. Um, it is in a situation where they get a break and it doesn't affect everybody else. It does affect everybody else. Um, we think this will be addressed in the courts first, but we need our legislators to understand this issue and understand how important it is and what impact it would have on um, all taxpayers in the state of Kansas who pay property taxes if this takes hold. And, and becomes accepted in the state of Kansas. So um, the KAC is working on this. Again, uh, we, we we're talking to legislators who have never heard of this. It, it's sort of a new issue. It's been accepted in some states, and it's already being argued in Kansas. So this will be an issue that we want to make sure that we educate our local legislators and others about what this is and what this means. So what we will be doing, uh, we'll be discussing these uh, legislative issues with our local legislative delegation next week. I'm scheduled to speak with them uh, during their meeting. Uh, we'll continue to participate and coordinate our efforts with the Kansas Association of Counties, which is in line with us on these issues. And we, during the session, we'll monitor, respond, and testify on these issues um, when necessary during the legislative session. And do you have any questions? Do you have any issues you want me to include or add or any other thoughts about any of this? No. Anything? No. Another good presentation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Next item, please. I have five administrative communications. Good morning, Commissioners. Kellen Seitz, Spectre Venue Management, the Kansas Expo Center. Uh, in the sake of time this morning and to hopefully uh, avoid paying a parking ticket, I will keep my update very brief. Uh, <clears throat> today we announced the uh, public holiday open skate schedule for Kansas Expo Center, uh, which went out via press release uh, and will be posted on our website and social media platforms. Uh, those dates will be December 16th through December 23rd, uh, where we'll host open public skating at multiple time periods through each one of those days uh, just before the Christmas holiday. Uh, and then also on Monday, I gave you <coughs> an update announcing, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, marketing and sales initiative uh, for the Cyber Monday uh, promotion of our tickets mm -hmm. at the Kansas Expo Center. I wanted to give you an update on how that did. We were very excited and, uh, and, and very thrilled uh, with the outcome of that. We sold uh, nearly 800 tickets for revenues in excess of $27,000. Wow. So uh, something we're very Great. proud of and, and hope to continue uh, on for all of our events in the future. Good. So, very good. Thank you. Really good. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Commissioner, Tom Block, uh, Public Works Solid Waste. Just to let you know, this Saturday is the first Saturday of the month, so Solid Waste will be having its Household Hazardous Waste event at its location at 131 Northeast 46th for free collection of herbicides, oils, any kind of household hazardous waste. Again, that's from 9 to noon, and uh, again, 131 Northeast 46th, which is about a quarter mile east of the roundabout <coughs> at North Topeka Boulevard and 46th Street. So, thank you. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else for administrative communications this morning? Commissioner Cook? I was asked by SLI to be a participant as a judge for the tree uh, mm, festival okay. at the Expo Center. I thought that the chocolate judging festival and a pie judging festival were hard. That was... <laughs> That's hard. Yeah. It was very difficult. There were a lot of good selections, so please go out and support uh, this worthwhile charity. Thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Viewer. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, I did want to make a note that we do not have a meeting on Monday, uh, December 4th. Our next meeting will be uh, next Thursday. And I wanted to also, again, recognize Councilman Cohen and thank him for attending our meeting this morning. It's always good to see you, sir. And uh, along those lines, uh, Tobacco 21, 
will be considered by the City Council next Tuesday. Uh, I hope uh, members of our health community will show up in force. And I also wanted to recognize and thank Linda Oaks, the director of our health department, for her fine leadership in this effort. Thank you. Next item, please. Item six, executive session. There's not a need. We're officially adjourned. Thank you for coming.